Um, so this, uh, this time I'll be talking about uh, models of dialogue. This is a very kind of popular uh, thing nowadays. And I think there's a lot of maybe a, a reasonable number of people here who are working on this either for a project or, um, or for their normal research. So if there's any interesting things that I'm missing here, uh, I'd love if people in the room uh, introduce, uh, introduce things. I know I didn't cover all the papers, uh, so there's some that I do know about that aren't covered in the slides just for, uh, for brevity's sake, but uh, I'd be happy to talk about other things as well. Um, so yeah, get that started. Um, so there's lots, uh, there's lots of different types of dialogues uh, that you can handle with computers. Um, so I guess you can kind of classify this into uh, who is talking, human-human uh, versus human-computer. I'll mainly be talking about human-computer dialogues, in other words, building systems that talk with people. Um, but human-human dialogue analysis is also something uh, interesting that a lot of people uh, are, are you know, working on. I, I won't have time to talk about it uh, this time, but uh, um, it, it's an interesting topic as well. You can also have one-on-one uh, -on -one dialogues versus multi-party dialogues, uh, etc. So multi-party dialogues, you have multiple people uh, talking. Um, I'll mainly be talking about one-on-one -on -one dialogues, where you have uh, one human and one computer talking. Um, also, why are they talking? So you can have um, task-driven dialogue where you actually want to get something done um, uh, or just chat-based dialogue where the main task of the dialogue is just to have you talk uh, and be happy with talking. And um, if you think about the dialogue systems that everybody's using nowadays like Siri or Cortana or something like that, which one of these do you think they fall in, under? Task. I, I would argue that they have both. Uh, so, like one of one of the things that made Siri, uh, as far as I know, um, when it first came out, was an entirely role-based system. But one of the reasons why it was so attractive was because they had these people like look at all of the things that people would ask Siri and group them into categories and then write funny responses for all of them. So um, that had nothing to do with making a particular task, but if you say, Siri, will you marry me? You know, coming up with a clever response is a good way to get people interested in your system and, and using it. So, um, but on the other hand, it can do things like, um, like order things for you or something. Um, I, I don't know if people have heard about the story of um, a thing where a little girl said, um, uh, I think it was Siri, buy me a dollhouse. Or no, sorry, Alexa, buy me a dollhouse. And um, because like one click purchasing was turned on, um, a dollhouse was delivered to their house. Did people hear about this? So this became a big news story in Seattle. So then on the TV, the TV reporter said, <laughs> the TV reporter said, so the little girl said, Siri, buy me a dollhouse. And of course, or uh, sorry, Alexa, Alexa, buy me a dollhouse. So of course, all the Alexas in the greater Seattle area <laughs> responded to this and uh, <laughs> purchased dollhouses. So um, we, we need to be careful when we're uh, building our systems to think about uh, potential complications like that. It's a moral story. And ap apparently there's a computational ethics class at CMU next semester, so uh, <laughs> you can hear all about those implications. Okay, so first I'll, first I'll talk about uh, models of chat-based uh, dialogue. I think a lot of people um, are very interested in this nowadays, and probably not because this is more useful than task-driven dialogue. It's just that task-driven dialogue is quite a bit harder. Um, well, chat dialogue, uh, not saying it's easy, but it's, uh, it's a little bit easier to get started on. So I think uh, people are, are currently very interested in this. And maybe over the next couple of years, task-driven dialogue will, uh, will become more popular as people get more familiar with uh, how to apply neural networks to, uh, to dialogue systems. Um, in chat-driven dialogue systems, you can kind of 
I guess in all dialogue systems, but also particularly chat-driven dialogue systems, you can kind of separate them into two paradigms. Um, it, one of the two paradigms is generation-based models. So the idea of generation-based models is you can generate any arbitrary string of texts. So that's uh, take an input and, uh, and generate a new output. Um, the good thing about these is if you want to be creative, uh, if you want to come up with, uh, with new things that nobody has ever said before, then a, a generation-based model is the way to go. Um, there's also retrieval-based models. And the idea of retrieval-based models is you take an input and you find the most appropriate output out of the outputs that you already have. Um, this is good if you want to be safe or at least relatively safe. Um, if you think about it, putting a chatbot in front of a person is kind of dangerous if you're a company because um, if your chatbot says something, it's like your company is saying it. So if the Google chatbot says something racist, then it's like Google is saying something racist. If the uh, Microsoft chatbot says something racist, then it's like Microsoft is saying something racist. So um, the advantage of retrieval-based models is you know it's never going to generate anything it hasn't seen before. Um, or it has, that isn't in the training data, so you can kind of filter the training data ahead of time uh, to make sure that, uh, that it um, is safe. So, um, first uh, generation-based models. Um, the first generation-based model, um, okay, so I realized looking at the slide that I should clarify. So before 2011, of course, there was lots of work on dialogue systems. Um, in previous dialogue systems, it was pretty common to have something like a template where you would decide uh, what you wanted to say and then you would fill in uh, words in the template. Uh, there were more complicated things with natural language generation, etc. When I say a generation-based model, this model was a model that had no concept of templates and would just generate uh, things based on basically a machine translation model. Um, so you take an off-the-shelf machine translation system, and this, at this point it was a phrase-based machine translation system. You would um, basically treat uh, what, time, what time you get out as the input, as the source language, and I get off at five as the target language. And you would, uh, you would use this translation um, model to do this. Um, I talked about translation models before in the sequence to sequence models uh, part. Um, one important thing that people realized already in 2011 before the sequence to sequence models is that dialogue generation is much harder than regular machine translation um, because dialogue generation um, has things like this, which is like, if anyone's still awake, let's play a game. Name three Kevin Costner movies that don't suck. Um, and then uh, the answer is easier question, please. Um, so you can see that really there's no direct correspondence between this. And in machine translation, you'll get idioms like kick the bucket, for example, uh, means die. Uh, that you need to have kind of a, a thing where you just map it all at the same time. But in dialogue, there's much more indirect uh, translations between, uh, between things. So in order to make this actually work, they had to do a lot of uh, filtering of the, the rules that you can use, et cetera. Then um, in 2015, uh, basically three places simultaneously came up with the idea of applying uh, sequence to sequence models to dialogue uh, response generation. Um, and like other uh, translation tasks, dialogue response generation can be done with encoder decoders. Um, it can be done with uh, encoder decoders with attention. It can be done with, um, uh, with others. So the, the simplest one, I think, is Sheng et al., um, where they basically just translated from the previous utterance. And you can get things like, uh, I guess they did this in Chinese, so the original is Chinese. But if you look at the English. I see all the Chinese people looking, so you can <laughs> you can look at the original and uh, I'll read the English one. But uh, high fever attacks me every New Year's Day. Get well soon and stay healthy. Uh, I gain one more year. Grateful to my group. So happy. Getting old now. Time has no mercy. Um, 
<laughs> That's a pretty mean dialogue system. <laughs> And then, uh, then other uh, other ones. Um, and then you also get things like we should go out with some cute guys to enjoy a great outing in such a nice weather. Um, and then it answers, it is indeed very nice weather, which is not super uh, not super interesting response. Uh, it's picking up on the nice weather, etc. So you can see it does a, a reasonable job, but it's not a, it's not perfect by any means. Um, but because dialogue and uh, translation are very different, um, it's not trivial to apply uh, like encoder-decoder models to dialogue uh, response generation directly. Um, and I'm pointing out a few other pro a few problems here. Um, if there are people here who have done dialogue and think there are more problems after the three that I mentioned here, I'd love uh, I'd love you to uh, point some out. Um, I, I'm sure there are. Um, but one is dialogue is more dependent on global coherence. So um, considering only a single previous utterance will lead to a locally coherent but globally incoherent uh, output. So you will seem maybe crazy uh, because like the things that you said last time have absolutely no effect on what you said this time. So it'll be uh, your dialogue won't make very much sense. So. Um, it's necessary to consider more context. So an example of this is um, the method by Sordoni et al, which took not only the message um, that elicited the response, but also the context before it. And they basically had a, an encoder-decoder model that encoded both the context and the message, and then considered both of them. Um, uh, in contrast to... Uh, <laughs> This is in contrast to machine translation. So in machine translation, context can be useful. Um, th this is a very interesting paper if you're interested in context in machine translation. Basically, they took a state-of-the-art machine translation model at the time and applied it and realized that human translators without context are just as bad as machine translation, while human translators with context are much better than machine translation. So, um, they showed that context uh, can be useful in translation. And then in contrast, uh, in 2017, there's this paper that says context really isn't very useful um, in news translation. So the jury is very much out for sequence-to-sequence uh, -sequence models for MT, but for dialogue, I think almost nobody would argue that this is not necessary. Um, so one solution is to use a standard uh, architecture with more context. So um, so the Sordoni et al. paper, sorry, I, I mentioned this one slide too early, but basically they encoded both the context and the previous utterance. Uh, Vignoles et al. Uh, took this one step further. They just took in, in a very big LSTM and encoded all of the dialogue context up until this point. So they just memorized the whole dialogue. Um, and that allows them to generate dialogues that look a little bit like this. Um, they use um, customer service dialogues. So customer service dialogues are dialogues where you um, you basically ask questions about your uh, um, about whatever problem that you're having, and they use this to train. So you get hi, hello, uh, could you please let me know what are the operating systems you're using? I'm using Linux. Okay, it was in the SSL VPN on which you stated it was broken. Please check if you are logged into the corporate network. What is the error that you are running? Please, which is kind of kind of sounds like something like customer support. Um, <laughs> it's, not, it's not all that great. Um, I'm seeing an error related to VPN. What is the error message that you are getting when connecting to the VB, VPN using network connect? Connection refused or something like that. Uh, may I know the version, et cetera. And it goes all the way to the end. Um, and it's a little bit strange, but eventually somehow this LSTM manages to resolve the customer service query. Um, I wouldn't suggest deploying this on your actual customers uh, because <laughs> you might lose them very quickly. But uh, um, for the purpose of writing a paper, this, uh, this seemed to actually be able to capture some long distance dependencies just with a simple uh, LST. Um, since then, there have been much more sophisticated methods that people have been using. Um, uh, 
One is the hierarchical encoder decoder model. Um, so the idea is basically because we want to capture very uh, long dependencies between uh, things, we will want to um, have an utterance level RNN that tr allows us to track the overall dialogue state. Um, so we have a model that looks a bit like this. Um, we have a sentence level encoder uh, that gives us utterance representation, which is then encoded into the context hidden state, which is then used uh, on a sentence level decoder uh, like this. Um, so you can see uh, you can see something like uh, like that. And, but importantly, you have a sentence level encoder down here, uh, but the information about the context is passed directly from sentence to sentence. So you have a much more direct. Uh, a more direct path uh, from the previous sentence to the next sentence. Um, and this, uh, this was shown to, to work well in a dialogue model. Although it, it's very straightforward. Um, so this is a discourse level VAME model. Um, so this was actually made by uh, people in this room. Uh, so I think this was a very nice, uh, a very nice model. Um, so the idea is that you want to encode the entire previous dialogue context as a latent variable in the VAE. So the idea behind this is that it's not just the previous things that you said. You have a topic of the dialogue. You have um, the general content of the dialogue. Um, and uh, you can model this as a latent variable. So um, here's the general model. Um, so on the left side, uh, so this is a VAE, remember? So in the VAE, you have the inference network. Do, do you want to explain? <laughs> <laughs> I, I can explain, and then you can add, uh, add some. <laughs> uh, but um, we have the inference network that takes in our X. Um, it's also taking in the dialogue act Y. Or, sorry, it's called the recognition network here. It's called the recognition network or the inference network. And, um, the recognition network takes in, um, takes in the utterance, the dialogue act, and then also the context up until this point, and whether it was a person speaking or not. And you get the latent variable from this. And then you also have a prior network that's only, uh, that doesn't have your previous, or your next utterance. It only has your previous history. And based on this um, latent variable, you generate the output utterance. Um, so it's a pretty, um, it's a pretty reasonable uh, method for applying a VAE to this, but it also has a kind of interesting trick in that uh, they have a bag of words loss here. Um, so the idea is that you need to be able to um, directly guess the words in the um, in the sentence or in the utterance from the latent uh, representation. So why is this good? Um, one of the problems in VAE-based models is that you can get a very strong language model on the top right here. So if you have a very strong language model, if you get just the, few, the first few words correct, then you, don't, you can basically ignore the latent variable. Um, but if you have to predict the bag of words, the entire bag of words directly from the latent variable, the, um, the language model isn't useful in predicting things there. So you need to make sure that you encode all of the, uh, all of the information uh, within the latent variable as well. And this helps uh, prevent kind of the de degenerate solution that VAEs tend to have. Um, do you have any additional comments? Cool. So if you if you have any questions about this, you know who to ask. <laughs> so, um, cool. So this is all, this is what I have about um, about global coherence. Are there any questions uh, about that? No. Okay. Um, 
So the next problem in dialogue, this actually might be even a bigger problem than the global coherence problem, um, which is that dialogue allows much more varied responses than something like machine translation allows. Um, so for translation, there is lexical variation. There's like different ways to say the same thing, but the content basically needs to be the same. You can't, uh, you can't change the semantics of the utterance. Uh, otherwise, you'll be in big trouble. Uh, on the other hand, for dialogue, the semantic content will also be different. Um, so we have an example uh, of this. Um, so what are you doing? If you think about all the possible answers to what are you doing, um, I'm teaching a lecture on neural networks for NLP is what I'm doing right now. Um, that's a pretty unlikely response for most people in the world. Um, but it's, it's a valid response in this particular situation. So as a result, you have a lot of many, many different valid responses, some which only apply in some situations, some apply in many situations. But what neural dialogue models tend to do is they tend to predict the majority class. So people, some people in this class are having the exact same problem in their classifiers. Uh, it's tending to predict the majority class. So um, what are you doing? The, uh, the answer that the dialogue system gives is, I don't know. Um, what is your name? I don't know. Uh, how old are you? I don't know. <laughs> So the idea, the problem is basically, you know, I don't know is a pretty good response to a lot of different questions. <laughs> and, um, so it, it gets this bias towards things that are easy to predict, um, especially if it's something that it hasn't seen in its training data before. Um, so the way this paper uh, proposes to fix this problem is uh, basically a diversity promoting objective um, so the basic idea is that we want a uh, we want a response that is likely given the context, but it's not mundane. It's not uh, kind of a standard response that you can use everywhere. And there's a very easy way that they use to um, that they use to formulate this. It looks like this. Um, so. The, um, the thing on the top left is the log probability of the target given the source. And the thing on the right is the log probability of the target uh, multiplied by some content. They use u. Um, I'm actually not entirely sure why they didn't use p here, but uh, they use u here. Um, uh, but you could think of this as the log probability according to a language model over all your possible responses. And the, the idea here is if you do this, the second term penalizes things like I don't know that you can see in many different contexts. So it tends to favor things uh, that can be seen only in this context. Um, as a result of this, oh, I, so one thing I should mention is this is done only at decoding time. It's not done at training time. Um, and it's only, it doesn't really have a good theoretical interpretation from machine learning, from a machine learning perspective. It's just a nice heuristic that they can use to capture their intuition. Um, and it, as a result, uh, if it's, I did not get the report from an MI6 agent, uh, I don't think that's a good idea because you did the right thing, did you? And then you haven't been given an assignment in this case. Um, I've been looking all over for you. I actually don't know if these are better. <laughs> I'm losing my grip. I'm the only one in the world. Um, so I'm ready to help. I have something we need to talk about. So you can see in general, they, they tend to be a little bit more varied. Um, I don't know if they're a lot better, but uh, in some cases, they, uh, they are better. And this at least promotes diversity to some extent. Um, another thing is uh, diversity is a really big problem for evaluation. So diversity is a problem for evaluation in uh, machine translation as well, but it's a much bigger probability here, uh, a much bigger problem here. So um, translation uses blue score, and blue score, uh, which I've talked about before, basically uh, uses matches between unigrams, bigrams, trigrams, foregrams uh, in a reference translation and the translation that you generated. Um, translation 
for blue score, uh, blue score is not perfect for translation at either, but it, it's kind of okay. It kind of uh, tells you when one system is better than the other. In dialogue, blue shows very little correlation. So if you have the, the answer that the person actually gave and uh, you use blue score to evaluate it with the reference, this is what it looks like. Um, on the left, you have a human score um, on the x-axis and a blue score on the y-axis, and there's basically no, no correlation between these two. There's, uh, um, if you eyeball it, you can't even see a trend uh, that's not horizontal. Um, they also use something based on the average of uh, word embeddings, so they, they tried to kind of soften uh, soften their uh, their evaluation metric by saying things where the average of word embeddings is in a similar place in the space are probably more similar, so that would be a good evaluation metric, and that didn't work either. Um, then on the right side, what you can see is they split their human evaluators into two groups and measured the correlation between the two groups, and you can see the correlation is actually relatively strong. So what this tells you is Essentially, that blue score is no good, but it's not hopeless. Humans do agree uh, with each other on how good uh, the results are. Um, so one early piece of work that did this, uh, this is called the delta blue metric. Um, and they made two modifications to blue, uh, to blue score to try to make it work better with dialogue systems. Um, the idea is basically they use an extremely simple system to retrieve a whole bunch of kind of good looking responses. So basically, I think maybe they used Lucene, which is like this, this search engine type thing um, or, or something similar to it. And they retrieved a whole bunch of reasonable looking responses. Um, and then they had human evaluation. So then they... Um, So they had the context um, in the message, and then they retrieved these five responses on the bottom. And these five responses on the bottom are ones that are in that were not from this particular dialogue pair. And um, then they had humans evaluate these with a score uh, normalized between one and minus one, where one is the best response and minus one is the worst response. And, um, and then they had that for the, the true response also. And then they, oh, whoops. Sorry, I thought I had the equation down there. But basically the idea is they measured blue score, but every time they counted an n-gram uh, match, if it matched with one of the good responses, they upweighted the n-gram. If it matched with one of the bad responses, they downweighted the n-gram. So the idea is if you match things in the good response, that's a good thing. If you match things in the bad response, that's a bad thing. And they were able to sh show non-zero correlation with human evaluation using this metric. So this is one way to create an evaluation metric for dialogue. Um, anyone want to use this metric? Yes? No? I, I want to use this metric but I don't want to make six human <laughs> evaluations for each response in my test set. So this is, a lot of, this is a lot of work. It's even more work than just creating like five, uh, five translation uh, results uh, for MT because you have to get multiple evaluations for each response, et cetera. So um, this, is, this is pretty tough to implement. Um, so there's been a couple of thing of um, papers recently uh, on learning to evaluate dialogue systems. So the idea is um, that you actually train a model that uh, should give you better evaluation scores than, uh, than the original one that you have, or than blue, than blue or something like that. Um, so Lo et al, um, they use the context, uh, the true response, and the actual response to basically learn a regressor that pre predicts how good the, uh, the method is. Um, the important thing here is this is very similar to the dialogue model itself, um, but instead of only having access to the, um, 
uh, to the output, it also has uh, to the input, it also has access to the reference. So you um, you take in the dialogue context. Uh, so this reads in all of the previous utterances. You take in the true response. You also take in the model response, and then you have a regression model that basically runs the representations through a multi-layer perceptron and pr predicts the evaluation score. So what this is saying is, given this context, and given that somebody actually responded this is their true response, um, and the model responded this is its response, what kind of score should I give this? Um, so you're learning to model a human evaluator, I guess. Um, and this, uh, this, does, um, this does pretty well. Um, this does uh, quite well. But similarly, you still have the problem where you need, um, you need annotated training data in order to train this. Um, so uh, you still need something like, uh, like this. But the advantage of this model is that you don't need it for every test set that you want to run after that. So once you learn this model, you should be able to apply this evaluation model to other test sets. Um, another example of something that I don't know whether I, uh, whether I trust this as an evaluation measure or not, but I thought I should introduce it anyway. This is an adversarial evaluation, which is basically we train a model to try to discriminate between true and model responses. And based on that model that tries to discriminate between true, uh, between true uh, human responses and model responses, how often are you able to fool this model? So the idea is inspired by uh, basically adversarial networks. So adversarial networks, you have a discriminator. Um, but in this case, uh, in addition to just the input that you give to the model, you also uh, have access to the reference. Um, so this one has the advantage that um, this one has the advantage that you don't need any human annotated data, and you can just run it. But it also has a disadvantage that it doesn't necessarily have any correlation with human uh, human evaluation. Um, one caveat that I should say from um, uh, my experience with machine translation is that when you learn an evaluation metric, there's two disadvantages to this. One disadvantage is it tends to overfit to your t training data. So your evaluation metric might look very good on the data that you trained it on, uh, but it can be very bad on other data that you used. Another caveat is that this is really hard to interpret. Um, it's really hard to say why your model thought this was a good uh, response. And maybe, maybe your dialogue response was actually good, or maybe your dialogue response was horrible, but it just fooled your model into thinking, uh, into thinking it was a good response. So uh, I really like this direction, because evaluation is very difficult in, uh, in dialogue models, but I don't, think, uh, I don't know if this problem has been solved yet. Okay, um, any questions or anything? Yeah. I think I know another paper for the evaluation. Uh -huh. Sounds pretty possible. Uh -huh. So, uh, give the model some context, like the previous dialogues, mm -hmm. and uh, then give the model four options mm -hmm. uh, for, uh, for, for utterance, and one of them are the real utterance in the, uh, the corpus. The other three are sample the random. Uh -huh. Okay, so this is um, this is this is good. This is not necessarily a model of the generated output. It's a way of evaluating whether your model has the ability to pick the correct response out of uh, incorrect ones. So. Um, yeah, I, f I know about this work, but I forgot to put it on the slides. But basically, um, it can even be just two choices. You have, one, um, you have one response that was randomly picked from another place in the dialogue, and one response that is the correct response. And your model needs to basically do binary classification over which one was the correct one. 
Um, I guess this is kind of like the motivation behind this is similar to the motivation that Sam Bowman talked about at uh, when he was introducing the NLI, um, the natural language inference task, which is when you're doing generation, you have to think about a lot of other things, like your decoding algorithm uh, and other stuff like that. But if you just need to pick which dialogue response is the correct one, then it's just a classification problem, and you can worry on like modeling, worry about modeling context or semantics or, or whatever. So, um, do you know the name of the paper? Okay, eval okay, evaluating dialogue systems by predicting the next utterance. So if you want to take a look at that, you can find that there. Um, cool. Any anything else? Um, okay, so problem three: dialogue agents should have personality, or more importantly, dialogue agents should have consistency about uh, the stuff they talk about. So if we train on all of our data. Our agent will be a mishmash of, mishmash of personalities. So we get, where do you live now? I live in Los Angeles. In what city do you live now? I live in Madrid. In which country do you live now? England, you. Um, so none of these are consistent with each other. Um, so this is a problem if you want to make anything that people will feel is uh, plausible. Um, so yeah. Um, so there's some early work on this. Uh, this is a non-neural method in 2007. But the reason why I mentioned this is I feel this was really well done. Um, this is a very, very nice work um, that I don't think anybody has replicated something with this depth in a neural model yet. Um, but the idea is basically you want to train a generation system with controllable knobs, where each of those knobs is based on a personality trait. Um, and one example is extraversion. Um, so this is a, a system that was uh, created to um, basically recommend a restaurant for you. So given a structured representation of the restaurant uh, of the dialogue act, which is like a recommend restaurant, you have a thing that can generate different utterances based on how extroverted they are. An extroversion, if you if you don't know what this means, it's how like how much you like talking with other people or, or stuff like that. Um, so they came up with a whole bunch of traits, like how long is your sentence? How many positive words do you use? How many negative words do you use, um, et cetera. And a lot of these traits are kind of correlated with extroversion. Um, so if you go to the least extroverted one, uh, er, it seems to me like La Maurice is, isn't as bad as the others. So. This is basically not a very strong recommendation, right? But um, uh, it's, it's saying it's not as bad, you know, uh, which doesn't mean it's good. Right, I mean, Lang Maurice is the only uh, restaurant that is any good. Uh, so <laughs> that's also not very positive. Um, and then if you go all the way down to the bottom, basically, actually, I'm sure you would like Lang Maurice. It features friendly service and acceptable atmosphere in a French kosher and steakhouse place. Even if the price is $44, it actually has really good food, nice food. Um, so it's much more kind of like you kind of feel like this person is outgoing. So um, this, is a, this is a good uh, method of this. So you have a system called a personage uh, that they can use to control these things. Um, so one kind of application to something similar in uh, neural dialogue is uh, this persona-based neural dialogue model. And the idea is that you model each speaker in embedding space. Um, so each speaker, um, you have speaker embeddings for each speaker. So I think they did this, I believe they did this on Twitter. So for Twitter, you can find the username, uh, which means you can create an embedding for each user, and then you can generate the dialogue responses based on that embedding. Um, so all of the people, all of the speakers, I guess 70K speakers are in a single embedding space, and then you have all of your words in another embedding space. Um, the interesting thing about this is if things go really, really well, you could think that maybe these embedding dimensions encode the various dimensions of extroversion or, uh, or positivity or, um, or other things 
uh, other personality traits as well as um, uh, you know where the person is from or whatever. Um, I don't know if this model does that or not, but uh, if you're interested in uh, in something, I think this is a good place to start. And maybe combining the previous two uh, methods would give you something uh, interesting there. Um, another interesting thing that's very nice about this paper is that they didn't just model the speaker, they also modeled who the speaker was talking to. Um, and this is really good if you think about uh, a situation where, like, um, if you want to talk to somebody uh, who you want to be polite to, like a teacher or something like that, you will be more polite. Uh, whereas if you're talking to a family member or somebody else, uh, uh, like a friend, you don't necessarily need to be quite as polite. Um, it might also help model uh, whether two people um, basically talk about the same topics when they talk together. So if you talk, the people in this class, I'm likely to be talking about neural networks. Uh, my wife, I'm likely to be talking about my daughter, for example. Um, so um, I think this is a good model. I think there's a lot, of, a lot more work that could be done in this area as well. So um, this is a nice paper to read. OK. Um, any, any questions about these? Okay, so let me go. Let me go on to retrieval-based models. So retrieval-based models, as I mentioned before, are um, based on the basic idea that many things can be entered, uh, answered with basically template responses, template-based responses. Um, while there is a lot of variability in dialogue, a lot of the things we say, like I don't know, are repeated over and over and over again. So there's no need to generate them uh, anew. We can just look them up in a database. Um, simply find, uh, so you can simply find the most relevant response. Um, has anyone used Gmail on your, uh, on your phone and seen these responses down here? Um, these happened uh, about one year ago uh, based on a neural uh, retrieval-based model, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, I think these are awesome. I'm, I'm so happy that they added this feature because now when I'm walking to work, I can reply to like five emails uh, while I walk to work. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I think this is great. Um, this idea of retrieval-based uh, retrieval chat, um, this actually goes back a uh, fair ways uh, before neural models. Um, the basic idea is that given an utterance, we want to find the most similar uh, utterance in the database and return it. Um, before neural models, they actually did some stuff that was a little bit more sophisticated, like rewriting named entities. Uh, so they would rewrite the named entity into the named entity symbol um, and make sure that you, uh, in the location of the address, etc. Oh, th this paper was in Korean, hence the Korean, uh, hence the Korean text. Um, but uh, so then you get uh, where is loc type, um, and then it will look up the um, it will look up the original utterance. So basically, you have the the source utterance, the original utterance that the speaker made. It will search the database for the closest source utterance and then return its target utterance uh, like this. Um, so you can look up where is loc type in the database. It will say where is loc type and loc address. Um, uh, let me know where loc type is. Uh, and then it will res respond with the appropriate thing and it will fill in the template with the appropriate named entities, etc. There's also, here they also used a, a discourse history vector, but this isn't used in, uh, in many systems nowadays. Um, okay. So neural response uh, retrieval. Uh, this is a paper by us in 2014. I think this is actually the first time people applied neural networks to chat-based dialogue. Um, I wrote on Twitter, somebody please prove me wrong, and nobody has proved me wrong yet. So I'm, <laughs> I'm waiting for somebody to come up with an earlier one. But anyway, um, but the basic idea is 
in regular example-based dialogue, um, in regular example-based dialogue, you have a lot of trouble because of superficial differences between the source and the target. Um, so, like, let me know where loc type is. We'll get a uh, we'll get a lower score than um, please tell me the location of loc type because they don't share very very many words together. So, um, basically, what we did was we applied a uh, um, a sentence pair model, uh, specifically a, uh, a recursive autoencoder with dynamic pooling. Um, if you remember all the way back to our sentence representation, uh, our sentence representation class, uh, recursive autoencoder is the autoencoder that uses the parse tree structure, and dynamic pooling is a thing where you decrease it to a um, uh, to a fixed size matrix. Uh, uh, you decrease a um, a variable size vector into like a fixed size matrix and then compare them together. Um, and this paraphrase model was, uh, was uh, proposed by Sotur et al. in 2011 and then we applied this to dialogue and response retrieval. Um, and the interesting thing is if we get, uh, um, we can get a very nice looking kind of black line down the similar similarity matrix, which indicates a paraphrase. And if we don't, uh, if we don't get a black line, it's not a very good paraphrase. And this, um, uh, oh yeah, that's the model. And this basically improved the robustness of our dialogue uh, response retrieval method. Um, so going back to smart reply, the smart reply method um, is basically also a retrieval based method. Um, but they did a lot of very nice engineering, uh, scientific or engineering tricks. I, I don't know uh, which one to call them, but they did a bunch of nice tricks to make it actually work on large scale and work quickly. Um, it's very similar to the response retrieval model that I talked about before, but now they're using an LSTM sequence to sequence model uh, where basically the conditional probability of the sequence to sequence model is your retrieval score. Um, they're doing beam search over the response space. Um, so here, your response space is the space of all responses in your, in your database. So if you think about it, what is the space of all the responses in a normal sequence to sequence model? This is not a trick question. It's... What's that? The entire language, exactly. So it's all the sentences in English. What they do here is basically, instead of doing all the sentences in the language, they limit it to only things that in, are included in the database. And you can actually come up with a, um, a nice, I, I don't know exactly how they implement it because they don't mention it in their paper, but you can come up with a nice try structure. So if you think back to your data, uh, your data, uh, sorry, uh, data structures course, um, you can come up with a try that is basically like this book, um, this place, and then you have other things like this, this, which don't, uh, which don't appear in the try. So then you just don't allow it to generate anything that doesn't appear uh, in, your, in your dialogue. Um, so this is a much faster way to generate responses from your corpus. Um, they also do a thing uh, related to canonicalization of syntactic variants and clustering of similar responses. So if you have things that are different syntactic, uh, different ways of saying the same thing. Um, uh, one, one thing is, I'm not giving a lot of details on this slide, but the paper also doesn't give a lot of details about exactly how they do things. It's a paper at KDD, not an NLP conference, so uh, so the language part is a little bit uh, is a little bit uh, thin. But uh, basically, the idea is if you have multiple things that can be uh, pronounced uh, that can be expressed the same way, they canonicalize them into a single uh, single way. They also cluster similar uh, responses together uh, using, I think, lexical uh, metrics. They also do human curation of the responses. So at the very beginning of the class, I said response retrieval is really good if you want to be safe. Um, probably Google doesn't want 
dangerous things appearing on your cell phone when you uh, when you try to do a reply in Gmail. So I think from what they said in the paper, it seems like they did human curate all of the responses. So they, they had somebody check whether all of them were OK or not. Um, this is maybe the most interesting part uh, of the paper, which is that they enforced diversity um, by omission of redundant responses that looked similar to the other responses that you've already generated. They also made sure that you had both positive and negative responses in the three ones that you can, um, that you can say. So if it's something that's positive um, and you have a, uh, would you be available for a meeting on Monday? Um, it should have at least one response that's positive and one is negative. So you can either say yes, yes or no. Um, so I think this is a really interesting paper in that it explains all the stuff that they had to do to make this actually work. And then we can go back and come up with beautiful methods that does it even better. So um, if you're interested in uh, dialogue response generation, I think this is a good paper to read. Um, any, any questions about that? Um, OK. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, about task-driven dialogue. Um, up until very recently, there weren't a whole lot of neural models uh, for kind of end-to-end task-driven dialogue. Um, but this is becoming more popular nowadays. Um, but Chat is basically to keep the user entertained, to keep you, you know, talking to it. Um, as I mentioned before, but actually I realized I haven't mentioned it all this time, reinforcement learning is very popular in dialogue. And basically the reward for reinforcement learning in task completion dialogue is whether you complete the task or not. Um, in chat-based dialogue, you can think of it just as how long does the user talk to you. If they continue talking to you, then you're continuing to do a good job. So chat-based dialogue is a type of task-driven dialogue, but um, the task is just to keep the person talking. Um, it's very different. Um, uh, what if we, if we want to actually do something uh, like book a flight or access information from a database? Um, in this case, uh, suddenly, basically eliciting information from the user and using that information to do a final task becomes more important. And because of that, a lot of the task-driven dialogue work uh, focuses on ways to do this. Um, in the uh, recommended but, uh, but not required reading materials, there's a nice discussion of frame-based dialogue, um, which is the same thing as what I'm talking about here. It's also called slot-filling dialogue, et cetera. Um, so in semantic frame-based dialogue, the, the traditional way to do this is to come up with different components um, it, where each component does a specific task. Um, one is nat natural language understanding. Um, when dialogue researchers say natural language understanding or spoken language understanding, usually they mean filling the slots in a frame. Uh, so filling up the things that the user has talked about. Um, also dialogue state tracking, which is to keep track of the overall dialogue state over multiple turns. Um, dialogue control, which decides the next action based on the state, and also natural language generation, which decides what to actually say based on the, um, uh, based on the current state. Um, so at first, there were a lot of neural models that were proposed for each of these tasks. So um, I, there's several papers on NLU for slot filling with neural nets. Um, but I think this was one of the first ones and one of the more widely cited ones. And basically the idea here is you have a neural network that is a recurrent neural network that has to solve two tasks. One task is BIO tagging. Um, one task is um, deciding the intent in the domain. Um, so show flights from Boston to New York today. Um, it has named entity recognition. It also has slot uh, identification. Slot identification is a little bit like semantic role labeling, if you know about semantic role labeling. So you need to identify, given that the person is trying to find a flight, uh, where is it departing from, where is it arriving to, and um, what is the date? Um, and then there's also a domain of airline travel, which might decide which app uh, handles, uh, handles this. So if you have, um, if you have your smartphone, 
And you say Shou flights from Boston to New New York today. Um, actually, sorry. Show flights from Boston to New York today. So it, it was it actually able to do that? <laughs> the shortest flight is about one hour twenty minutes long. And because it's today, it's three hundred ninety-two dollars. Um, <laughs> but but anyway, um, so the I think <coughs> it's very likely that something like this is powering the the Google. Uh, assistant, um, and you'll notice that all of the uh, you'll notice that all of the time that you do a Google search, um, it's kind of pulling up a different app or a different interface depending on what kind of query you did. So that domain classification is doing that; it's deciding which app should be used to handle your, your query. Uh, where the intent classification. Probably the intent and domain could be merged together if you really wanted to, um, and then the slot filling will be dependent on the uh, on the intent, I guess. Um, this particular uh, method used an RNN CRF model. I've already talked about that, um, so there's not really much more to say here. But this is something that you can do. Um, so dialogue state tracking. This becomes very important for long dialogues. It also becomes very important for dialogues where we might have essentially errors in our understanding of what the user said. And one example of this is when you have bad speech recognition. Um, so basically what you do is you track the belief about our current frame filling states. So I have this. A small figure uh, that is uh, that's kind of hard to read. You you might also notice the bus numbers here uh, look familiar. <laughs> this is <laughs> this is Pittsburgh uh, bus. Uh, this is Pittsburgh bus uh, um, like a Pittsburgh bus guide app created by Microsoft Research in Seattle for some reason. <laughs> Uh, well, the reason is because Alan Black uh, and Maxi Neskenazi uh, made the Let's Go corpus, which is a very nice corpus for dialogue. So, uh, so now everybody creates nice bus uh, bus guides for Pittsburgh. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, so first the um, uh, the system says hello, hello, which bus route? And the user speech is sixty one C. Um, but for whatever reason, um, the speech recognition result is not very good, so it misheard it as 61B. You know, C and B are easy to mistake. Um, so based on your speech recognition confidence and your uh, based on your speech recognition confidence and uh, your like NLU natural language understanding confidence, you get a distribution over. Um, you get a distribution over your beliefs about uh, each of the slots that you have. And um, then based on this distribution, you decide what to say next. So if you aren't very sure about any of the responses, then you might confirm uh, and say, sorry, which bus route, 61C. Now you're more confident. Um, and, uh, and as a result, you can gradually um, say, 61C, is that right? Yes. If they say yes, then you're very confident. So, Basically, this is framed as a problem of tracking your beliefs over various states. Um, and there is something called the Dialogue State Tracking Challenge that tries to do this. Um, it started out on this rather simple uh, bus, uh, bus guide dialogue, and now it's moving on to progressively more difficult things with worse spe speech recognition, bigger spaces, et cetera. Um, so Henderson et al. present an RNN model that can, uh, encodes multiple uh, ASR hypotheses. Um, another interesting thing it does is it generalizes away by abstracting away uh, the details. So um, it kind of uh, detects named entities and other things and also inputs uh, an abstracted representation into the model. Um, I think part of the reason why they did this was because they were doing this in 2014 and trying to get, trying to get a model that works really well. Um, I think now uh, probably this is less necessary, uh, and you can just use distributed representations of some sort to uh, handle your generalization. 
Also, um, language generation from dialogue state with neural networks. Um, this is another thing. I've actually talked about this one time uh, before uh, in the natural language uh, generation or the conditional language modeling part. But um, basically, it's, a, uh, it's an LSTM type model um, where the LSTM units are conditioned based on the, um, on the dialogue at uh, that you want to generate, where the dialogue act is encoded as a one hot vector, and then you input this into uh, you input this into a dialogue act cell that basically keeps track of your dialogue acts over multiple time uh, time steps. Um, so what I've shown here is that you can basically implement all of the components in this regular task based dialogue pipeline using neural networks, and um, and this has been very effective at improving uh, these dialogue systems. And then recently, there have been some interesting papers on kind of end-to-end -end dialogue control uh, with, uh, for task-based dialogue with neural networks. And this was a nice paper from ACL this year. Um, so it's interesting in that it kind of followed the traditional task-based dialogue framework, but it made it end-to-end -end trainable. Uh, so, let me see. It has exactly 17 components, so I will, go, I will go through all of these 17 components one by one. So basically you take in an utterance, um, you get a bag of words from the utterance, you have an utterance embedding model, you do entity extraction, um, you have an entity tracking thing that keeps track of uh, entities um, uh, over the entire dialogue. Um, and then you have uh, various features that you extract. And this gives you basically the input to your RNN. You could imagine that this is, you don't need any of these things um, and you can just do the utterance embedding, but I think the entity tracking is pretty important here because you need to keep track of what entities have been used throughout the dialogue. Um, in order to get a consistent response that is So now you have four vectors. These vectors are put into your RNN. Um, and then based on this, you have, a, uh, you have an MLP plus a softmax. Um, oh, in your RNN, this uh, continues from time step to time step. It's in, a, in LSTM or whatever. But that continues to time step to time step. And then you have a, uh, a dense layer and a softmax. Now, the most interesting thing here is that you can either make an API call, um, which is a call to, for example, show me flights from here to here, or you can create another utterance. And both of these are decided, um, both of these are decided uh, in a single softmax. So um, I, I think this is a pretty interesting method, um, and this is a, uh, when you're deciding the utterance, you're deciding from templates. So this is a retrieval-based approach when you're doing uh, when you're doing utterance or confirmation. Or Based on that, you choose your action template. Um, you also insert entities. So if you get something like city right, city comma right, um, then you insert the entity, the city entity, in, into there, and um, this gives you a fully formed action. If this is an action type, um, if, if, sorry, if this is an API call, then you make the API call and you get the result and you display it to the user. Um, and maybe that is your, your weather five day forecast or whatever. Um, and then that API call result is put back into your RNN. Um, uh, in addition, the action that you just did is put back into your RNN. So this is, it's a highly engineered model, I think, because you need to hook it up to all your APIs. You need to do entity tracking and filling. But the nice thing about it is basically all your interactions with your cell phone can be modeled as one big RNN over like forever, which is great or creepy, depending on which way, <laughs> which way you look at it. There's an RNN somewhere remi remembering everything you ever said to your phone. Um, so. Uh, another interesting thing about this paper is this is trained um, using a combination of supervised and reinforcement learning. So they, uh, they annotated a bunch of different utterances with, uh, with kind of Wizard of, Wizard of Oz 
uh, results. So they, they went back and uh, did a thing where uh, the human controlled the dialogue. But then after that, they had it uh, updated with uh, policy gradient uh, based reinf uh, reinforcement learning. Um, so I think this is a really exciting direction because now we can kind of mix task-based stuff, chat-based stuff uh, in a single framework and actually make it do, you know, not just chat with you, but also do uh, useful things. Uh, so um, I guess that's all I have for today. Are there any uh, questions? Um, can you use synthetic data? Well, you could um, you could deploy this to users and have the user use it, and then um, one standard um, there's ways you can get reinforce uh, reward. Uh, you can estimate the reward uh, for task completion dialogue. So one is like how quickly do you finish your task? Um, uh, if you're doing something like displaying links, uh, does the user click on the link or do they continue to go do something else afterwards? So you can come up with rewards that are pretty good indicators of whether you're doing a good job. So uh, this could be continued uh, to be updated. Anything else? Any other like interesting directions in dialogue that I missed here that people had to mention? No? Okay. If so, I'll, I'll finish up. Thanks a lot.